innovation that we keep hearing about. So thank you for making time and coming. I will tell you a little bit about myself, if we could have my slides. So I'm the founding editor of a magazine called Wired in the UK, which tells the story of the people building the future, not just in technology and science, but in design and architecture and business models. Um, it's online, it's a magazine, it's social, and it means I've spent a lot of my time out at the tech startup hubs, out in the technical universities, um, traveling probably 150 flights in the last year. And also I've got to work closely with a bunch of startups, advising them, sometimes investing them, startups like Improbable that are making platforms that allow you to simulate billions of things. Companies using artificial intelligence like Grammarly, which I think started not far from here, to help auto-correct. Um, but I'm going to talk now about an obsession that our culture seems to have with finding innovation, whatever innovation is. And because there's so much competition in every sector, because the barriers to entry for starting a company are collapsing, because anybody can rent space in a hardware factory, because anybody can use cloud services to do a digital company. We're starting to find organizations getting funding to do things that maybe aren't really that worthwhile. Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas every January is meant to be where the latest tech innovations are shown. And this year we had things like this. This was reported in the media, celebrated. This is where tech innovation has got, making pointless things that nobody needs. But somebody thinks, well, this is a new idea. We'll put it to market. And there's a history of pointless innovation becoming products. There's a startup called Quirky that used crowdfunding and crowdsourcing to get people to design products like this, called the Milkmaid, which is a jar that tells you when your milk is starting to go sour. It sends you a message to your app. And they made this, and it was sold. And it's completely pointless. It's like, are you going to get a notification in the middle of the afternoon business meeting and then rush home to change your milk? Quirky, thankfully, went out of business, but not before they'd released another completely pointless innovation, the smart egg tray. And the smart egg tray, which they sold for, I think, $50, if you're the sort of person who's obsessed with how fresh your eggs are, you're in luck. This will send you a notification when you need to start thinking about throwing away those eggs. This is what I call pointless innovation. And sometimes, pointless innovation gets really well funded. So this is a company in the US called Juiceru that raised $120 million of venture capital money to make a juicer that sold for $700. And it was internet connected, there were sensors everywhere. You had to buy these special supplies, which were very expensive, put it in the juicer, and the $700 juicer squeezed it for you and gave you your juice, which was getting a lot of hype. A lot of investors were worried that they'd missed out on the greatest invention in juicing ever until Bloomberg did a little experiment to see if a human could just squeeze the capsules with their hand and get a similar glass of juice, which they did. So they realized that actually it was a complete waste of time spending the $700. And Juicero went out of business. So I feel sometimes with technology, we're in kind of this era where we find a new way of doing something and we get really excited about it, even if it's a little pointless. And now every company is obsessed with finding this magical thing called innovation. 
and they're starting to invest really quite large amounts of money in building an accelerator or building an incubator where they can touch startups, where they can get to know the heroes of our story, the people building the new companies. So there are incubators for food. This is a big American company, Chobani, that's got one. Lots of finance tech incubators. The big banks, the big financial service companies are very concerned about not being able to move as quickly as the design-led, blockchain-led, crypto-led finance startups. There's a lot of money going into these. Even aviation is building its own incubators. Airbus, among others, are building spaces where startups can go and work in the hope that Airbus gets some of that magic dust from the startups. So it's not wrong in itself. I mean, it's a great thing that big established companies are starting to think, well, what could our business become? How do we keep up with the trends on the streets? How do we find alternative ways to challenge our bureaucratic corporate thinking? But most of the time, it delivers no value. Most of the time, it's just going through theater. And we're celebrating innovation like it's some new religion. I've started collecting streets named for innovation. If you go to America in California, Innovation Street, Innovation Way in Florida, this is in Liverpool, Innovation Boulevard, doesn't look that innovative to me. Um, in Canada, everywhere. And I think we forget what we mean by this thing, that you all use this word, innovation. I use it all the time. And it becomes a bit meaningless. So I think about it in a fairly simplistic way. Because it's about delivery. It's not just about coming up with an idea. That's just creativity. It's about delivering something that will add value tomorrow. And that's really all it is. It's not magic. It's not fairy dust. And it's important because if you are a city government, if you are an automobile manufacturing company, if you are a financial service business, you need to think of future because the future is coming ever faster to you because of the emergence of artificial intelligence, internet of sensors, new ways that the crowd is empowered as opposed to the old hierarchy with you deciding the tastes of the public. So you need to be alert and plan for it, but you need to execute and deliver. So I've become a bit obsessed with how organizations can deliver something of value. And I made it a bit of a personal quest, a personal journey to try and find examples where it's actually really quite exciting, where it's actually working. And I'm writing a book that's going to be published next May in which I'm traveling so far to 18 countries to find case studies. And some of them I'll share with you. But I think the reason this is important is exemplified by just one slide. And this is a slide showing the homepage of a bank, HSBC, that has been annotated by CB Insights to show for every link on the homepage some of the startups trying to eat some of that lunch of the bank. So for borrowing, for foreign currency transaction, for insurance, for everything mentioned on the homepage, these are just some of the startups. And I could show you a similar homepage for delivery companies, for media companies, for medical device companies. And it is true that you can't keep still because there are newcomers, small, motivated teams who are using emerging technologies. They're prototyping, they're understanding what the customer wants, and they're delivering. And we're in the context of the exponential curve hitting all sorts of sectors beyond IT. So we know about the exponential curve that is Moore's law. 
because of the falling cost and the rising power of transistors, because of the miniaturization of chips, something that was expensive over time goes through that curve and becomes ubiquitous, becomes commodified. Well, it's not just hitting now IT, it's hitting all sorts of other things. It's hitting the falling cost of solar energy. So this is an exponential curve. The falling cost of solar power per watt, since 1975, it's gone from about 100 US dollars to less than $1. And then, of course, that changes consumer behavior. On the right is the rising exponential curve of the number of solar panel installations that consumers are now putting up because it becomes cheaper and it saves them money. And suddenly, if you are a utility company, if you are making electricity or gas available to the consumer, this is a reality. This is something that you can't ignore because that exponential curve starts slowly and then goes almost vertical. And it's hitting things that are actually going to make our lives a lot better. This is an exponential curve showing the falling cost of sequencing a human being. And this is a logarithmic scale, but the green curve is the falling cost of sequencing DNA. And it's falling more quickly than the straight line that is Moore's law. And that means something that 17 years ago cost $100 million is now $100 and is coming down to the price of a cup of coffee. And, you know, suddenly, Medical science has to assume that we're going to start sequencing everything. We're going to sequence the tumor as well as the patient, and that changes the approach to medicine, and it's happening now. And it's crazy. There's a startup in England called Oxford Nanopore that makes a gene sequencer that plugs into the USB of your computer, and it costs less than $1,000. Oxford Nanopore, you would put a little drop of blood in there, and in a few minutes, it tells you if you have any kind of medical condition. And you don't have to be in a hospital. You can be in the middle of the Sahara Desert. So it changes the reality. And why does this matter? Why do these exponential curves matter? Let's say if you're in business. Because something that we're now starting to assume will be everywhere, just a short while ago, was technically impossible. It just wouldn't work scientifically. So in 1994, Microsoft launched a big project to try and teach the network how to understand the human voice. And the first year, it couldn't make it work at all. And it was only five years ago that they got it working 23% of the time. Then last year, they announced they'd got it as good as a human. And suddenly, we're all putting these spy devices in our bedrooms, in our living rooms. Companies dealing with customer service have to have a voice strategy because the customer is expecting something that was impossible just a couple of years ago. And it creates kind of crazy situations. I don't know if you saw at the Google Developers Conference um, a couple of months ago, there was an artificially intelligent voice that started ringing up hairdressers to book appointments. How can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. It was a fake voice. Google got told off afterwards because ethically it should have announced that it was not a human being. But we are at that stage. It means you can have some fun with these devices. Somebody took two of the Google Home devices and put them next to each other so they had a conversation and they filmed it for eight hours and put it on YouTube. Um, and this is just a tiny bit. I'm not going to give you the full eight hours, but this is, they're like French philosophers, very depressed French philosophers. I'm sorry, what was your question again? What do you think is the meaning of your life? What's the meaning of life? That there is no meaning. Then why do we continue to live? Why are we living? Because we are selfish. So they must have consumed a lot of Russian Why literature, I think, to do this. But um, after about the fourth hour, they start to have a, like a marital argument. But I won't bring you that. Um, but artificial intelligence is moving so quickly that it is changing business reality. So you have to innovate. You have to use it. I mean, this is Amazon's version of a store 
that it started as a prototype in Seattle, and now it's just rolling them out slowly. It just opened a second one. It's the store that doesn't have a cash register because there are sensors and cameras and proximity sensors in the app on your phone that know it's you taking the item off the shelf and it's creating a new layer of convenience. And of course, nobody wants to stop and stand in line to pay. So every retailer is now looking at this and thinking, we're going to have to be at some stage as smooth in our customer journey. Innovation, real innovation, is coming from the skies. So there are consumer companies like Planet, one of many companies putting small nano satellites in the air. I mean, this is what it gives us. This is filming Apple's headquarters in Cupertino being built when Apple didn't want anybody to take pictures of it. Because you can now subscribe to the feed of companies like Planet and see parts of the world that were, until yesterday, invisible. So we have, through satellites, through drones, whole new layers of visibility about what's happening in real time in our world. We have data that we can process to help understand agriculture, people's movements, all sorts of things. And these are emerging technologies that are going to change our world. And you can't ignore them if you are a business, if you are any kind of substantial organization. And it's going to change our life sooner, I think, than many of us think. The autonomous car is going to be safer than the human driver. The World Health Organization says about 1.2 million people are killed every year through human error in driving. And the technology is pretty much there. Prices are coming down. But what does the car of the future become as well as autonomous? Well, this is the head of the chip company, NVIDIA, with his vision just a year ago of how the car is going to work with the driver. The artificial intelligence network, the deep learning network, just by studying her eyes, is able to figure out what direction she's gazing. Maybe she's um, looking at, uh oh, no, shouldn't do that. Okay, so that's called gaze tracking. And this next one is really cool. This is inspired by, this is lip reading. Take me to Starbucks. So your car will be reading your lips to go where you want it to go. And then think of the progress in interactive visualization. So we are now messaging companies to get an answer. We're tweeting them. But maybe the expectation soon will be, will be talking to a very human-like bot that responds to us. And there's a startup in New Zealand called Soul Machines that's making these very humanoid bots that it's using for customer service applications. And Mark Sagar, who founded the company, used to work in Hollywood on CGI. He worked on movies like Kong and won um, Oscars. And now he's applying this strength to how can you create an interactive person who's only in the screen. So these are not videos of people. These are computer generated. And there's a webcam and a microphone on a computer that will then respond to your facial Alex. expression and your voice. Yes. No. No. Maybe. And of course, Goodbye. they translate in real time too. Willkommen in Deutschland. So, some pretty clever stuff around the corner. And How can I help you? At the same time, everything is being turned into data, even crazy stuff. Now, don't tell any French people because they'll get very upset. But there's a startup I got to know in San Francisco that's using molecular plant science to analyze everything in a glass of champagne, a glass of wine, and to replicate it without using grapes. So they take the viscosity, the alcohol content, 
the gas above it and they duplicate it just using combinations of plant molecules. The company is called Ava Winery. It's received venture capital funding. These are the founders. And they're making wine that actually tastes like it was made with grapes. And they're coming into a market. I think I tasted their Japanese whiskey that they had made without using the whiskey making process. Which, I guess, if they can make wine out of data, everything is being turned into data. So the next question is, OK, we see the change. What do we do about it? And typically, the CEO appoints somebody as the chief innovation officer, or they have another building somewhere, which is their corporate innovation lab. And that, to me, is a bit like Wile E. Coyote in the Roadrunner movies only realizing he's fallen off the cliff when he looks down. You know, you're running because you've got profits each quarter, but only when you pause do you realize you're walking on air. And this is what we get as a result. We get fake innovation, bullshit innovation, innovation theater, people pretending to be making change, but really the leadership team is just thinking of the next six months profit. And you know, I'm from a media business. The media was in denial for so long about the internet. They thought it would go away because there were still nice profits coming from classified advertising in newspapers, from fashion advertising in magazines. And of course, at some stage, you realize you're walking on air. But I'm gonna share with you what I'm saying that actually seems to be working as a way of confronting this. I'm going to give you 10 themes, 10 approaches that I'm saying that I'm writing about for my book, and maybe one warning sign. And the first of these approaches, you thought you were this kind of company, but actually, if you think about your value in a different way, maybe you can be future-facing, not past-facing. Um, I'll give you an example from Finland. This is the biggest bank in Finland called Oppa, and it's more than 100 years old, and the leadership realized that a lot of the services that the bank is offering are being commodified. Startups are doing them. The customers are not going to pay extra for the services that the bank has provided. And so they're spending 2 billion euros at the moment, turning it from a bank that sells products into a bank that offers services and new kinds of services that will keep its customers, who are also members, co-owners of the bank, to make them happier, more loyal, to actually solve problems. They've built five private hospitals, this bank, in Finland, and they're performing surgery. And the beautiful thing is, because they're not from the standard healthcare background, they're coming in thinking, how can we make the most efficient hospitals? If you need a scan because you've broken your leg, you get it the same afternoon. If you need an operation, you get it the next morning. And they've created a health insurance product that because the hospital is so efficient, has lower premiums than the commercial rival health insurance products. A bank performing surgery. It sounds like a crazy idea, but it actually is simply the bank finding a new way to add value through the difficult bits of its customer's life. They also realized that 10% of the profits of the bank come from lending money for people to buy cars, and they figured maybe in 10 years people will not be buying cars, they'll be using the network of autonomous cars. How do we stay relevant in the mobility business? Their answer is, what they call mobility as a service. The bank now has an app that lets you rent cars by the minute. So it's rethinking what a bank is in people's lives. I'll give you another example of an organization reframing its value. Um, this is a bookshop in a very expensive street in Mayfair in central London that's been there since the 1930s. It's got the royal coat of arms because it sells books to the royal family. You may think it's not a great time to be running a bookshop in a very high-rent area of London, and you're right. 
except they reframed their value. They thought maybe rather than consider ourselves experts in selling books, we become experts in curating collections of books. And so they started offering their service of creating a personalized library for people who don't mind spending quite a lot of money. So they'll get to know you, they'll get to know your interests, and they will choose books for your personal library. They recently did a 3,000 book library for a wealthy Swiss lady in her mountain chalet, and they charged her about $700,000. And I tried to have a meeting with them to interview them for my book, and they said, sorry, we can't see you for two months, we're too busy, we have too many clients. They also now do a subscription book service. If you go into the bookshop and they get to know you, you can pay them maybe three or four hundred dollars a year, and each month they will choose a book that they think you will like, and they will gift wrap it and mail it to you in the post. A couple of thousand people are now doing this. So it's rethinking the value. They're paying for that personal service. So that's reframing your value. Another approach that I saw in particular in China is if what you're doing is kind of not very exciting, is commodified, maybe you can build an ecosystem with other partners to create value for both of you. This is um, Lei Jun, who runs a company in Beijing called Xiaomi, which makes these very high quality phones, um, much cheaper than Apple phones, because they make no margin on the devices. They make no profit on them. Um, instead, they make all their money selling accessories. And he's often been accused of trying to rip off Apple, and you know Johnny Ive has complained about them just copying Apple. And he even made the mistake Lei Jun of once going into a keynote wearing the black turtleneck jumper that Steve Jobs used to wear, and he used the phrase, one more thing, which was never a clever thing to do. And I'm not going to make any judgments on what the Xiaomi stores look like, but they've done something really clever. They have a team of about 40 engineers whose job it is to find hardware startups, get to know them, and say, we're going to make a small investment, maybe $100,000. We will give you access to our supply chain, to our 300 million customers, and we will promote your products. We will put them in our store. We will put them in our app. In exchange, we want our logo on your product and most of your profits. And now I think they've done more than 400 of these investments. And this is how they make an awful lot of money. The best-selling air purifier in China the best-selling battery charging pack. These are not made by Xiaomi, they're made by startups they've invested in. And I asked the guy running the investment team, I don't understand, you're hardware, you make hardware, why don't you make this yourself? And he kind of smiled and said, you know, at the time there were 8,000 people in the company, and he said, if we were making all these accessories, we'd have to be 20,000 people, and we'd become a bureaucracy, we'd never get any decisions made. Plus." The startups have to survive on the streets every day by knowing what the customer wants today, not yesterday. So we would rather they take that risk. So we put him on the cover of Wired, saying it's time to copy China. There's another approach to building an ecosystem, actually, um, just across the water in Estonia. The um, gentleman here is called Kasper Korgis, and he was doing an internship with the government when he had an idea, why don't we allow people who don't physically live in Estonia to become digital residents of Estonia, and they can start companies here, they can take part in all sorts of other activities, but they don't need to move here. So he started what's called the e-residency program. He's based in Tallinn in the capital, and they now have large numbers of people every day going to a website, paying, I think, 100 euros to sign up and becoming e-residents. I think you can do it today. And 
it means you can set up a company inside Estonia, which has a relatively good tax regime and trade anywhere in the world. So they're building an ecosystem for a country that sees itself as having no borders. When I saw him, he said, we want to be like an app store. We want to be a platform. We want other governments to start offering services on our platform to the e-residents. They're talking about doing a cryptocurrency so that if you're outside Estonia, you can invest in their economy through the Estcoin. This is a country. This is not a startup. This is a country thinking in a very unusual, bold way. One approach I kept seeing on my travels was the very few companies that can create agility, the ability to move quickly, to have small teams prototype, test, iterate, work out what works, what doesn't work, close down the projects that don't work. They're the ones who seem to have an advantage. I was in Sydney, Australia. Just next to the airport is the headquarters of Qantas, the big Australian airline. And they've had some really tough years. 2012, 13, they lost billions of Australian dollars. And it's a hard business running an airline. You don't control your main cost, which is oil. You compete with the low cost carriers. The internet travel companies take a lot of your commission. And so what do they do? So they realized, well, they have this asset that other competitors don't have, which is a loyalty program that has half of the population of Australia. The Qantas loyalty program has 13, 14 million people out of 27 million people in Australia. And people love it. It's not like a normal airline loyalty program. They earn points when they go to restaurants. They spend points in supermarkets. When you go on vacation, you earn points. And they thought, people have this emotional connection with the loyalty program. They trust us. Trust is a really rare thing. Why don't we build all sorts of businesses on top of the loyalty program? And so they built, or they took a team into a warehouse building just across a parking lot from headquarters. And there's now a couple of hundred people, 150 people there, prototyping new businesses that they could build on top of the loyalty scheme. And they do agile development. They have two-week sprints where they show the rest of them what they found and get people's feedbacks. There are post-it notes everywhere as they're coming up with ideas. It's not how an airline works. But the loyalty business has now generated very profitable businesses. They've created a life insurance business. They've created a health insurance business. They've created a food and drink business. You can join the wine club and get the wine that is served in the first class cabins. They've created credit card businesses, foreign currency cards. In the last annual report, these businesses built by the Agile team on the loyalty platform were about 30% of the profits of the whole company, and they're forecast within five years to be the biggest part of the business. But I'll give you my favorite example of an Agile team helping modernize a tired institution, and I'm going to take you to the Pentagon, where I spent two days last month with a team of 40 people, mostly recruited for a year or six months or two years from startups. And they are part of something called Defense Digital Service. And Defense Digital Service came out of the US Digital Service when Obama created health.gov and they had big technical problems. Nobody could sign up. A bunch of startup people volunteered and they solved the problems and it became a digital service. So the people inside the Pentagon, they don't wear uniform, they're not military. They wear hoodies and sneakers and they're like pirates. They swear most of the time. They find ways to hack the bureaucracy. 
and they see themselves, they're constantly talking about Star Wars, they see themselves as the Rebel Alliance. In fact, it's the biggest office building in the world, and if you go past every office, there's usually the colonel, the general whose name is on the door. This office, there's nobody's name on the door, it just says Rebel Alliance. And they've created a culture inside the Pentagon, just 40 people in a business that employs three million people, where they are now getting respect. This is the guy who founded it. His name is Chris Lynch, and he doesn't look like a military guy. But what they've done is changed the culture bit by bit by thinking like pirates. They even have a pirate flag in there. And they started offering bug bounties, just like a private company would do. You pay a reward to hackers, friendly hackers, who have found problems with your website. They'd never done that inside the bureaucracy. They launched a very successful bug bounty competition. The first bugs were found within 13 minutes of the competition launching, and they saved millions of dollars for a cost of about $150,000. And since then, it's become standard inside the US Army, inside the US Navy. Other things they've been doing include going to the front line and trying to work with the soldiers on problems that they haven't been able to solve with the big, expensive procurement technologies. So one of the problems they were trying to solve is how you bring down, let's say, in Afghanistan, a commercial drone that may have explosives that was sent in by the enemy, by ISIS, and they found a way to hack together, for not very much money, a device that blocks the signal of the drone. So a small team that's agile, that doesn't have the thinking of the bureaucracy, is now being taken seriously by the bosses and referenced by the US Defense Secretary as a team that other parts of his organization need to talk to. There's another approach that seems to be useful, which is accepting that if you don't allow failure in your organization, you're not going to create the culture of experimentation so you need to give your team psychological safety to try difficult things and see if they work. And the most exciting place this has happened is in Mountain View. It's a place called X. It's the secret research lab of Google. And they fail quite a lot. In fact, they've developed all sorts of processes around how you get some very smart people together, give them the freedom to decide what projects they want to work on, really ambitious projects. They call them moonshot projects. Give them a bit of resources. Then if they seem to show some success, give them more resources. But find a way for them to kill a project if it's not going to be super fantastic. This team has created the self-driving business, Waymo, the self-driving car, that is going to be potentially a $100 billion business. It's also recently spun off a couple of other businesses. They've developed a company that spun off recently called Loon, which uses gigantic balloons that fly at the stratosphere that send internet connectivity to parts of the world that aren't online at the moment. They're partnering with telcos. It's a really difficult problem to solve, but by giving their team the psychological safety to try to experiment, they've done it. There's another project, which is a drone project, which they've been trying in New Zealand, Australia, they've been testing. They've just relaunched this as a separate company. There's all sorts of amazing projects that they've done. There's a kite that generates energy and sends it back as it floats in winds just offshore, sends the energy back through the cable. So I talked to 
a woman who did a very ambitious project there. Her name is Kathy Hannon, and she started as a marketing executive, but she was obsessed with one thing, which is, could you take seawater and separate carbon and hydrogen from the seawater and use that to make a carbon neutral fuel that could power vehicles, that could power all sorts of things. And there was a researcher at Park, Xerox Park, who'd been working on this, and it seemed that theoretically it was possible. So she proposed to her team, to her bosses, that she'd like to at least try to see if this was possible. They gave her a little bit of money. They got the guy, the professor from Park, to come on the team. They called it Project Foghorn. And when you start a new project at Google X, one of the things you have to do is commit to a kill criterion, which is some number that will decide if you kill the project. Because otherwise, we get too attached to the projects we're working on. And so the kill criterion for Project Foghorn was when they finally produce fuel, it has to be no more expensive than American petrol gas at the gas pump, which um, I think was about $8 per gallon, per US gallon. And so over two years, she kept having more success. They found a way to separate carbon and hydrogen. They even had a trial of some of the methanol that they'd created. Um, and scientifically, it seemed that they were onto something. They managed to get the price down from the equivalent of about $1,000 per liter to $25 per liter to $20 per liter. Even they thought it could come down to $15, $13 per liter. And then she went to the boss and said, we're going to kill the project the project that I think could change the world that my team has been working on for two years. And she got a cash bonus, and all her team got a cash bonus for killing the project because Google wants to incentivize people taking charge so that the resources can go into another project. And the reason she killed the project was she realized it was going to be too expensive an investment initially to get the price right down. Plus, at the same time, the price of oil had collapsed from $100 a gallon to about $50 a gallon. So this project, which could well become a multi-billion dollar business, no longer exists because Google X found a protocol for encouraging people to be in charge of their destiny. And it's a crazy place. This is the guy who runs it. His job title is Captain of Moonshots, he really does wear rollerblades as he's going around the office, and his name is Astro Teller, although his real name is Eric. And his main job is creating a culture where people can propose bold projects that use emerging technologies that could benefit billions of people and that find a new way to do something. And often, it doesn't work. This was a complete embarrassment for Google this failed as a consumer product. And they've learned lessons from this. I think they told the marketing story too loud, too early. But without that failure, you wouldn't get the chance to build this. Sometimes you're not Google. Sometimes you're not starting from zero and building your own culture. Sometimes you're an existing organization that isn't really fresh in the way it thinks. So you can just import a culture. So what if you're a country called the United Arab Emirates and your business model has been selling oil, which is no longer going to be a valid business model in just a couple of decades? What do you do? So I went to Dubai where the government from the top is obsessed with how you can make new kind of businesses turn Dubai, Abu Dhabi, the Emirates 
into a future-facing economy? And their answer is look around the world and take the best ideas that you find in other places and try and create the conditions locally with regulation, with tax benefits, with funding, where people want to experiment there. So I spent some time with this gentleman, who is the Minister for Artificial Intelligence. Probably the world's only Minister for Artificial Intelligence. His job, well, step one, get all government departments automating the way they deal with citizens, so it's friction-free, they know everything that you're going to want. He got married in the main government building on the ground floor, where they have a space you can go for government services, you can go and renew your driving license in just a minute. He got married in there using a telepresence robot. His bride was sitting there. He was video conferencing with a judge. He repeats the vows. And then when they'd finished the vows, another robot comes in with the marriage certificate. That's what they're aiming at. But after they've got the government, which is obsessed with targets and KPIs, focusing on artificial intelligence, they're now trying to get the universities to teach the AI that will be needed in the future. They're trying to attract other startups to come there. Um, and this future obsession is everywhere. The building that the Dubai Future Foundation works out of has been 3D printed because they wanted to be able to say, you know, we've got the biggest 3D printed new building in the world, I think, when it was built. They're building a museum next to this called the Museum of the Future, not of the past, of the future. And they're trying really hard to create the conditions where the only rules are those that the people building tomorrow's technologies can make. It may not entirely work. It's not the sort of environment that attracts most of the startup entrepreneurs I know. It's not the most free society. They have big human rights issues that they're grappling with. But it's a bold step from a government to try and make itself relevant for tomorrow. Another organization that's trying to build the future is literally a dinosaur institution. It's the Natural History Museum in London, where there's a thousand academics writing learned journal articles about butterfly wings, and they can't rely on government funding. They're competing for your attention with smartphones. They put a tech investor on the board, Simon Patterson, who is from a firm called Silver Lake, where they do things like they bought Skype for $2 billion, and the next year they sold it for $5 billion. And so he has been helping them think, well, if I was taking this as a project, like a turnaround project, like a tech company, what would I do? And they're bringing in people from other industries. They're bringing in people who worked at Amazon previously, who worked at digital media companies, who worked in retail to try and use modern technologies, import that culture inside the Natural History Museum. Now, at Amazon, if you're starting a new project, the first thing you must do is get everybody to come together to write a press release at the very beginning so you know your ideas are aligned. The academics at the Natural History Museum have to do that now. They have to write the press release together. So importing a culture, as much as other things, depends on sometimes leaving the culture alone whilst the existing business does its thing. There's a business in Los Angeles that's called the Interactive Corporation that owns a lot of very big internet properties like OkCupid and Match.com and um, travel websites. They invested a bit of money in a startup called Hatch Labs, and Hatch Labs was prototyping apps and seeing which ones worked and which ones didn't, and if they worked, they might work a bit more on them. It was like a factory 
for building apps, and it doesn't matter if they screwed up because there would be a hundred other apps they were working on. And Interactive Corporation gave them space in their office, actually, across the corridor from Match.com, the big dominant dating company. And um, this is Whitney Wolf, one of the people who was there who was telling me about it. Um, it was crazy, kind of punk kids in their 20s. There were sexual harassment cases that came to court afterwards. They didn't keep the same office hours as the people from the big corporate. And a lot of what they were building went nowhere. So they built you know, apps where you were invited to submit videos of your friends doing stupid things. It kind of died. And then, as they were sitting across the corridor from there, as well as the apps that didn't work, they came up with an app that did work called Tinder, which caught fire, even though it was existentially threatening the business model of Match.com. But the beautiful thing is Interactive Corporation didn't try and kill it. They just let them go, and it's now, well, a much bigger proposition than Match.com. It's a hugely successful business, but I think it only happened because they were allowed to keep in their little office their own culture. So sometimes the people at the bottom of an organization are smarter than the people at the top. And the thoughtful leader realizes that they need to get out of the way. Um, next week, I'm going to see the man who runs this country, this company. Um, this is Ilka Pananen in Helsinki, who runs a company called Supercell that makes games you've probably played. And they've created a culture inside Supercell where he wants to be, as he says, the world's least powerful chief executive. They've created teams, cells of maybe 15 people who have creative freedom to decide what they work on. They come up with the new games, narratives, the new characters, the new games. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't work. They get the company together every Friday and they discuss things that didn't work as well as things that did work. And they toast with champagne the failures and they write on the champagne label what they learned from the failures. So I think it's quite an enlightened boss that wants to be less powerful than the other people at the bottom of the company. There's a hotel in the center of London called Claridge's, which is like a six-star hotel. The guy who owns it wanted more space, couldn't build upwards, and had an idea he wanted to build five underground stories for the hotel. But he had two rules. He wanted to keep the hotel open, because he didn't want to lose the loyalty of his customers. Whilst they were building, he wanted to keep it open. And the only way builders could get in or out was a two meter by two meter window at the back of the hotel. And for years, building companies, engineering companies said, this is the impossible project. This is the impossible basement. You're not gonna be able to do this. And then a company that's owned by its staff called Arup, based in London, that does a lot of the world's great engineering projects, like the Burj Al Khalifa or gigantic bridges. Um, a couple of their people went there and they got excited about the challenge. And at Arup, if some of the people at the lower levels of the company get excited, they can build a team inside the company. And they decided they were gonna take this on and think of a logical way of solving the problem, which they did. Because they're now about halfway through building these five underground stories. I was in the first basement level in a hard hat and boots a few months ago. And the way they solved it, they got miners from Ireland hand digging little tunnels 30 meter deep, just the size of your shower, but 30 meters deep, filling it with concrete, and then putting the whole hotel on top of these concrete pipes, and then digging underneath it and if you go upstairs in the hotel, you have no idea that there's building work that's been happening underneath. And so they solved it, and they solved it by empowering the staff to get excited. A few more approaches I'm seeing. There's 10. Number seven, 
find ways to get part of your organization looking for things that are not at all relevant now. There's a software company called Autodesk that makes some of the world's leading design software. Architects use it to build buildings. Car designers use it. They have a team there that works on projects that may or may not be relevant in five to 10 years. So as well as all the standard stuff that they make their money on now, AutoCAD and other tools, they have a peer in San Francisco, Pier 9, where people come and play. When I went there, they were playing around with robots, seeing if they could teach the robots how to make movements that were really hard to program. They have 3D printers and laser cutters and water jets to encourage people to start making new kinds of things. They want to learn the behaviors of people. They invite artists in as fellows. One of the things they discovered they spend a lot of money investing in AI, how that could help design. It was something called generative design, which is a way that as you're designing something with their tools, the AI works with you and gives you thousands of possibilities at the same time. You give it the parametrics. You say, I want to design an airplane seat. I want it to be this heavy, made of this material, and I want you to give me the options, and it works with you. And it started out as just a play, let's experiment with AI. It's now in the products that are starting to hit the market, and it's potentially a multi-billion dollar product line of the future, because this team that we're playing has actually come up with things that match the changing needs of the Autodesk customer, because they looked at their blind spots, at the things they didn't think were relevant. You could also look at emerging tech and think of how it's relevant to you before your competitors. There's a fertilizer company in Norway called Yara that is one of the world's biggest fertilizer producers, but their factory is a thousand kilometers north of Oslo, and they have to spend a lot of money on trucks, tens of thousands of truck rides a year. It's expensive, it's polluting, they find it hard to get the driver. Um, last year they announced as an experiment, they'd invested $40 million creating a new way to carry the fertilizer to the ports, an autonomous electric cargo ship. This is a prototype of it. They announced this last September. Suddenly they get calls from other companies in Norway saying, yeah, we have a problem with shipping stuff, trucking stuff across the country. Could we pay you to use your autonomous electric cargo ships? And I was talking to the guy behind this, and I said, you do realize this could be as big a business as your fertilizer business, because you found a need that lots of other people have, and you're early in this. So we're at that age. We heard a lot today in the discussions earlier today about blockchain. Could blockchain save a commodity manufacturing company like HTC, which makes phones, but its market share has been falling, and you know, anybody can now make smartphones. They're now early in a new project, which is trying to create a new kind of phone that has a personal digital wallet that is secure, that allows you to keep your crypto assets, but also allows new kind of apps that bypass the traditional app stores. They're called distributed apps, and they're trying to find ways to allow everybody who has one of these devices to earn credit if they share their bandwidth with the network, if they give access to the sensors on their phone to the network. So by being part of that distributed network, you could also earn tokens. It's a new way to think about a phone. They're using this technology to see if they can change what kind of business HTC is. A couple more quick things. Very useful thinking about the design of your workplace so that it can encourage people to come together and challenge each other and come up with new ideas. Um, Tony Shea is obsessed with this. He built up this company, Zappos, a shoe company that Amazon bought for a billion dollars 
Um, and he's based in Las Vegas, the cheap downtown part of Las Vegas. And he's obsessed with how you can create the conditions in the office where people feel like they're at a party. This is what his office looks like. Um, and the part of Las Vegas they're in is pretty low rent. It's not sumptuous. Um, not many fresh fruit grocers in that area. So he's been spending $350 million of his own money trying to create the physical space where creative, talented people from outside Nevada come and build startups. He's been funding cafes and restaurants and theaters and creches. And it's not been an entirely successful journey, but it's a fascinating experiment. This is the goal, I think. He talks about looking for the three Cs. I want a place where people collide, they learn together, and they're connected. That is an approach which I think a lot more organizations should be emulating. There's a temporary city this week in the Nevada desert called Black Rock City, which is where a festival called Burning Man is held. It's 70,000 people. It's a no-cash economy. It's a gift economy, but also a creative expression economy. And people take on a persona at what they call the playa, the beach, um, and experiment. They prototype things. And I think you wouldn't have companies like Airbnb, because half of Silicon Valley goes to Burning Man, with it were you not having this kind of experimentation, which is why I think we're finding a new interest in co-working and co-living. In Paris now, a railway station has been turned into Europe's biggest co-working space. In Shenzhen, probably the most exciting entrepreneurial town I've ever seen, everybody's kind of crammed together competing for slight advantage in making hardware. You know, the collisions create new approaches. There's co-working spaces. I'm involved in one called Second Home as co-living. Now people are living together, private rooms upstairs, communal kitchen and living room and workspace downstairs. This is a company called Rome. Um, office design may even help solve cancer because the British Welcome Trust and Cancer Research Charity and a couple of universities have just opened in the center of London, near St. Pancras, this building, which is the biggest biomedical research center in Europe called the Crick Institute. And it's been designed to have no walls on the inside so that people from different specialism combine. They collaborate, they work together. The data scientist will meet the biochemist, will meet the genomics expert. And they say that is how you're going to find radical new ways to treat diseases. And I guess the last approach is accepting that things are going to go wrong in whatever kind of organization you're running. But use it, don't run away from it. Exploit that crisis. Um, I was in Mumbai in India two weeks ago where there's a company that makes cotton towels and bed sheets and rugs. The company's called Wellspun and it's one of the world's biggest makers of cotton towels and bed sheets. Um, one in five sheets sold in America is made by Wellspun. And they had a little problem. Two years ago, the big American retailer Target put out a press release late on Friday night saying the luxury Egyptian cotton towels that they'd been selling made by Wellspun, they tested them and they weren't actually Egyptian cotton. It was not what it claimed to be. Something had gone wrong in the supply chain. And Target said, we're no longer going to work with this company. We're going to refund your money. And, you know, cotton is a pretty basic material, but there are 17 steps between picking the cotton and having the final product. And sometimes things are mixed together. So there clearly was a problem that the towels, the sheets, weren't entirely Egyptian cotton. And the share price collapsed. It kind of halved over a couple of weeks. And the company thought we could be out of business. Other American retailers were saying, we're not going to sell these either. 
and it became a big public scandal. So they decided they have to accept it. They have to invest, first of all, in putting right what had gone wrong in paying compensation to customers. But why not use this crisis to become, if transparency is such a problem in the supply chain, why don't we become the most transparent company in textiles in the world? Why don't we use emerging technologies to track every aspect of how cotton comes from the field to the final sheet? So they created a project called WellTrack, which involves putting these little RFID radio tags on every bale of cotton, tracking it using scanners at every stage, putting barcodes and QR codes on the final product as well as on every stage. They're just coming to market with this and they've realized the customer wants to know not just for their Egyptian cotton but where everything comes from and they may pay a premium for this and just like you're paying a premium for your organic food that you know how it's been sourced they've hit on something that is going to be actually a boost to the business and even though they've invested quite a lot in the short term early signs are that they've actually found a way to make themselves more competitive with more business lines in the future. I'm gonna leave you with one warning. The big risk is thinking, well, it's not gonna affect me. We're not that kind of business. We're not that kind of organization. And it's kind of dangerous. There's a magazine cover I remember from 2007, which had the head of a company called Nokia on the front. And this phone called the iPhone had just come out, but the cover line was, Nokia, one billion customers. Can anyone catch the cell phone king? What do you reckon? So it happens quite a lot. Established successes think, well, we're fine. We don't need to worry. 2004, another magazine put the founders of a company called Skype on the cover, and the head of tech for the landline company, AT&T, dismissed them. It's like, what they're selling is a toy, it's not a threat to us. Six years later, the New York Times wrote a piece about an emerging company called Netflix, and they quoted inside the head of a big media company, Time Warner, Jeffrey Bukes, as dismissing it kind of rudely. It's like, is the Albanian army gonna take over the world? <laughs> I don't think so, but I will leave you with, um, when this came out just over 10 years ago, the head of another big tech company that was making smartphones was asked on television whether he saw this as the threat, and he laughed. $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. How did that work out, Steve Ballmer of Microsoft? Thank you. And I am very happy to take any questions. We can have a conversation. You can throw things at me. Um, if you have a question, just raise your arms and there are some microphones around the room. A microphone is finding you. Hi, my name is Elizaveta. Yeah. Hey there. My name is Elizaveta. And uh, 
So, my name is Yelizaveta. There's this movie called Her. You probably saw this movie. It depicts the future where the voice assistant is created individually for every person and that voice assistant knows everything about the person, his feelings, anything. And this assistant helps the person to live, to work, and turns out in the movie that this voice assistant becomes kind of a lover, a soulmate for a person. And uh, they get into a relationship, and they get married, and on and on. So the question is, do you think this could really happen in the near future? So the star of the movie, Joachim Phoenix, fell in love with the voice of Scarlett Johansson. Unfortunately, <coughs> she had 5,000 other boyfriends at the same time, which didn't end happily. Um, so the question is, <coughs> Can the AI know us well enough to create emotional connections? And I think obviously yes, because the AI is already starting fights with people on social media, is already persuading people to change their voting, and we're just at the very early stages. Um, there's a lot of research going into emotion recognizing tech, voice recognition, facial expression recognition, um, and the machine learns reinforcement learning. It has large data sets of people's behavior, and it can learn to hack your emotion. And if you think a lot of the cyber attacks that we hear about in the news start off not with some very clever technical hack, but somebody is psychologically hacked. Somebody is persuaded to give data to somebody who rings the call center at the phone company. Um, so we are emotionally pretty unsophisticated and vulnerable, and at some stage, not too far away, a startup will develop the persuasive AI that will own our souls. And it's not going to be Facebook. Спасибо. Hello, good evening. Thanks uh, for your insights. And my question is about your view on future of work. The trends are 150 years ago, uh, almost everybody were in agriculture. Now it's about two to three percent. So 100 years ago, there were big armies. Now there are no big armies. In accounting, the same story. We don't need gr big group of, groups of people. So what do you see? Will it be another work, or work will be luxury, or work will disappear, or what? Thank you. So, I'm an optimist, generally, about technology, but I will qualify that with some ethics. Nobody here, I think, wishes that we were 100 years ago when we all had to work in the field and it was a struggle to feed our family, or we had to work in um, servitude in service. We appreciate having choices. Um, automation and artificial intelligence is going to take a large proportion of today's jobs. It's not going to be a great investment becoming a truck driver or a taxi driver or even a radiologist in a hospital when the machine will be doing those jobs more cheaply, more efficiently, more accurately. Um, and an awful lot of jobs that our children will do haven't been invented yet. The question is, what happens to the distribution of wealth that this automation creates? And can we stop it going to a few monopoly companies? Um, network effects mean, you know, the company that is already dominant in the network tends to own the space. Once <clears throat> a company like Uber has put a lot of its competitors out of business, it's going to put up its prices. And the same goes for um, the social networks that you know, dominate search and dominate communications with pictures or messaging. One, I think we need to have a public conversation about what we want out of work and whether actually we need to create 
a new value system where your identity is not simply the job you do, because more of us will be needing to spend time caring for our elderly relatives, um, and that doesn't have much status at the moment, but maybe when you meet somebody on your business card, it will also include something like that. To how we can train people to keep learning new skills. So rather than university at the beginning of your adult life, university every second year for a month, I don't know. Um, but make sure that the schools are teaching people adaptive learning and curiosity. And I guess three, make sure that those who have been left behind have the economic means to survive. There's experiments at the moment with guaranteed minimum incomes, um, but we probably need governments to step in and decide and regulate, but we need the conversation now and we need to have a public and informed public debate. I'm sorry. And then there's questions here. Can you hear me? Hello. Oh. First of all, thank you for your inspiring presentation. Uh, my question connected with the previous question, uh, connected with education. I'm sure you know that uh, today uh, a lot of tech companies uh, offering jobs without university degrees, including such names as Apple, IBM, Google, and so on. So uh, does it mean that uh, today college degree uh, uh, no longer a guarantee of uh, intelligence and commitment? So no college degree, uh, how it helps? Education has become, in many countries, a very <clears throat> profitable business that leaves students in serious debt and is not necessarily teaching the skills of tomorrow. It's just something that your parents expect you to do. Um, and it is broken. Now, I think it's pretty wise that companies competing for talent don't artificially constrain their pool of talent by saying, right, you don't have this on your resume, you didn't spend three years getting drunk and learning some things. Um, it's much more relevant to tech companies. Do you have the technical ability or whatever other skills they need, the marketing skills? Um, that often comes down to aptitude and an ability to learn on the job. So then the question comes, how can we reinvent what college is to make it more relevant for tomorrow's economy. There's a very interesting experiment happening in Paris, funded by a telco billionaire called Xavier Niel. It's a school with no teachers, no lessons, and no school fees. And it's called 42, 42, and you get in through competitive tests online. So 3,000 people do a course online. Maybe 300 are chosen to come and spend a few days at the school. And those who perform best, maybe 100 are invited to come and do a course. And it's um, <clears throat> self-learning. And you mark each other's work, and you get gamified credits for doing that. And you get... Um, the chance of an internship in a lot of big French companies. But it's a way of finding people, no matter what their background, no matter their race, their economic income level, their parents, and seeing who has the ability to learn tech and giving them opportunities. And I think we need more of this kind of experimentation because um, I think, as I said in my definition of innovation, it comes down to delivery. Can you execute? A lot of the big um, success stories in entrepreneurship haven't come through conventional backgrounds, and they break the rules. And I guess that's how you build the games company of tomorrow. Sorry if anybody here works at a university. Hey, David. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, hello. That's how it works. First of all, thank you so much for such an inspiring presentation. And the question will be, where is this 
ethical border in terms of collecting all the data regarding the emotions, regarding the face recognition, and um, do you believe more in the positive outcome of this or in the negative outcome of this? I believe in the power of people to stand up and say, no, I don't accept that. I believe in a conversation in rooms like this where people say, hang on a second, we need to challenge <clears throat> what's happening with our data. And um, we haven't had those conversations loudly enough. <clears throat> it took, in the UK and the US, um, Cambridge Analytica to start to wake people up <clears throat> about what's happening with the data broking industry, how your personal data is being sold and cross-matched. Um, this is just the beginning. And privacy was something most people didn't care about because of the convenience of free products they, w they were using. We need to have that conversation and tell people, as Yaron Lanier wrote in his book, um, Who Owns the Future? If you don't want to give all the value of your personal data to these you know, multi-billion dollar companies, find a way to reclaim the value so you will have ownership, not just commercial ownership, but ethical ownership. Um, so I think we should probably be a bit more angry about what's happening to our personal data. It's a very, very murky business out there. Thank you. David, uh, thank you very much for the lecture. So I understood from the lecture that you have made about 150 flights in the recent year, and you paid lots of attention to consulting startups. So, yet you are one of the uh, chief editors of a very respectable magazine. So, how do you put it all together? How do you find time to consult startups and manage the editorial team at the same time? I stopped editing the magazine yeah, um, last year. So, I... I'm doing everything now that I was doing except managing journalists, which not even an artificial intelligence could do. It's a very challenging job managing journalists. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of out at the edges trying to understand where the future is being built. And you know, you have to go to the technical universities. <clears throat> you have to go to meet the investors, the researchers because um, it's moving very quickly. Sorry about all the flights. I will plant a forest, I promise. Uh, David, good evening. Uh, my name is Irina. Uh, what do you David, think about the innovations in Russia? And does your magazine, or did your magazine while you were editor, wrote about Russian startups, or Russian technologists, or something like that, or Russian inventors? So uh, I think before going to Russia, you try to get more information. What uh, technologies do we have here? What startups do we have? What innovations? What is your opinion about that? So just to be clear, are you asking me about what I think about startups here, or more generally politics? In Russia. In I think Russia. it's always unwise for somebody to come to Moscow and start talking about politics on stage. OK, that's, uh, that's just about business, no politics uh, at all. So are you asking? my impression of the startup scene here. Yes, about uh, ecosystem of startups in uh, Russia, of innovations in Russia. So, okay? um, there's a project that we started at Wired seven or eight years ago, um, looking for the 10 cities in Europe with the most exciting startup scene, and each of those, the 10 hottest startups that people were talking about. And some years, Moscow has been in there, but not recently, I think. Um, and one of the challenges <clears throat> is um, if you don't have a strong ecosystem where the talent will go from other places, it's really hard to create world-dominating companies. And most of the big tech company successes are in a small number of places where they don't just get investment and advisors but they get access to talent. And I was having a conversation earlier today. Um, maybe your government here is too nice to talent and gives the talent jobs that keeps them from taking risks and going to start something that could become the next WhatsApp. 
So I'm optimistic that the startup culture here is going to grow and build a lot more significant success stories. Um, but it's probably not going to come because government has decided there's a part of the city it wants to be a startup area. Um, it's going to come because the talent, which can go anywhere in the world, has decided this is the opportunity, this is the market, this is where they can get the investment, this is where they can get the um, most educated people who can do the things that they couldn't possibly do in San Francisco. And, you know, it's tough competition. You know, Lisbon in Portugal is now growing very fast as a tech cluster. Um, Barcelona, uh, Oslo, these, these are all kind of emerging. You have a lot of advantages here. You know, places like this, the Strelka Institute, are pretty important in building that town square where there are collisions and ideas. Um, but maybe you also need to build a culture where it's really cool to take a risk and go and do something difficult. And that's a real problem that Paris has. In Paris, your parents typically want you to go into a high status job. It's completely contrary to that to go and do um, a startup in the railway station with hundreds of other people. Um. <clears throat> David? Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, welcome to Moscow. Uh, oh. My question is mostly about automation. You said that without moving your lips. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, my question is about automation and uh, what it's going to mean for the... Oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't realize I have to stand. Um, so this automation movement that's happening right now is really being spearheaded by just a few select advanced countries, I mean developed countries like the States, Japan, China. Uh, what happens to the third world countries, the countries that are not uh, ready or able to embrace, uh, embrace automation and the countries that, you know, even, even mentally are not ready for it, not, not technologically or mentally. Um, for example, Russia, I think, is, is, even though we have a lot of potential, uh, there is really not much discussion about automation going on right now. And in, in 30, 40 years, when, uh, say, America is 40, 45% automated and, and countries like Russia are not, do we fall completely behind, or what happens, what happens in the end to our economy, to, to, um, to the people? Are you talking about automation or artificial intelligence? Automation. So uh, the interesting thing about robotics and automation <coughs> is the price is collapsing just as it is for software. And the ability of a lot of developing nations and if you go to India you see they're finding ways to hack together solutions not shiny Swiss made ABB computers um, robots but lower cost just good enough versions of what they're building I went to Bangalore and saw a team that was making a lunar rover that they were trying to send to the moon to enter a X Prize competition, and they didn't have vast amounts of money to do this. The um, question comes with AI, I think, which becomes much harder to solve. So the Chinese government is leading a big push to make China the dominant country in the world for artificial intelligence within the next decade. Um, and because China is not a classic democracy, the government can achieve things that would be harder to achieve in a lot of other places. Um, and it may well win. And that's going to create new competitive threats in lots of industries. Also because I think a lot of ethical questions that would be debated in other places probably won't be publicly debated inside China. And um, America is already waking up to this, especially the defense establishment is starting to say, hang on, we can't just watch China dominate AI. Um, it's our national security that is at risk. For automation and robotics, I'm less worried because I think a lot of the tools are going to be 
as commodified as a smartphone is. You can get a $30 smartphone now. It won't be an Apple, it won't be the best Android Pixel, but it will be good enough for a lot of people. There was a gentleman here who was speaking, but he didn't get a voice, so do you have a microphone still? Why? Production of labor is increasing, yet working week is the same, five days, five, seven. Because the a convention that we haven't yet broken, and I guess because we're allowing... This guy Karl Marx once talked about <laughs> what happens to the proletariat's labor and the capitalists that take it. I think that's happening again. If you look at the wealth that's being generated in a small number of organizations, that um, is not necessarily going back into the wider economy. If you look at the number of big companies that are not paying tax in a way that people would see as fair, um, it's not in the interests of the elites to give you a four-day weekend unless you revolt, but I'm not coming to Moscow to propose revolution. <laughs> it happened before and it didn't work out that well. Hello, thank you very much. Hello. My name is Nadia. Uh, I, m my question is somehow connected to the first one and uh, it's a very general question considering artificial intelligence uh, don't you think that artificial intelligence will sooner or later take over humans and just destroy the humankind because of it not being very productive? I'm not as productive as an AI because um, I should be writing my book at the moment. I think, no, this is a... <clears throat> depends on your time scale. So a lot of the worry about the artificial intelligence deciding humans are inefficient and it should get rid of the humans um, is about a general artificial intelligence rather than the specific use case AI. And companies like DeepMind have been trying to build the general AI. And, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. And even the people inside those companies think it's decades away. What's happening now, though, is the beginning of a strong ethical discussion about how we want to constrain the algorithms, how we want to create a sense of what shouldn't be allowed. And um, a lot of companies are being forced, that are developing the talent, are being forced to say, we're not going to work with the military. We are not going to use the AI for purposes that are going to be harmful to humanity. Um, in any dialectic, it's important to have the continuing debate that can shape what happens. Left alone, sure, the algorithm will decide the people polluting the planet um, probably should be eradicated because they're very inefficient. Um, maybe we want to ask the algorithm nicely to preserve the people, but we'll try and pollute less. Or maybe you can use AI to create cleaner fuels. Are you worried? Yes, I, uh, yes, I am. Um, I just wanted, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say that you've been showing a lot of exponential growing things. And from my point of view, I guess we can underestimate technology, uh, artificial intelligence technology, so that it is on its first stages, but it could be growing extremely fast afterwards, so that's, that's, the, that's my fear. I think it will, um, but I think it's starting from <clears throat> a much lower base compared with the um, development that is needed to have the full cognitive abilities to decide and the physical power to decide, you know, this species is irrelevant, we don't want this species anymore. Um, but I reckon you've got at least, you know, five years to relax.
Any more humans? There's a question. Yeah. Hello. I, can you can you elaborate on? Um, uh, should I talk? Uh, hello, my my name is Minit Akla, and I'm running a space startup. We're can you put the microphone nearer? Sorry, I can't hear you. Hello, my name, my, my name is Mina Takla and I'm running a space startup. We're actually trying to combine artificial intelligence with geospatial imagery to understand uh, global phenomena like cr climate change and predict disasters. But we have a bigger vision in the future, which is to advance nanosatellites and use them to map and, map and mine asteroids in the future. Um, which, which can help us uh, understand the composition and uh, the chemical composition and the um, uh, concentration of elements on asteroids. My question is, do you think vision is one of, uh, setting a bold vision, a bigger vision, and, but yet achievable milestones is one of the approaches to real innovation, or is it just unrealistic? I like having met a man today who's going to mine asteroids. Moscow, raise your game. Um, <clears throat> having a strongly articulated purpose that goes beyond the business goals of the next one year, two years, five years, <clears throat> is an amazing way to attract talent that's motivated, that could be paid more elsewhere. Um, it's a very effective way of navigating the highs and lows of the startup journey because you're looking further ahead at what you're aiming at. And it's also a very powerful way of getting partners to want to work with you because they believe in what you're doing. <clears throat> I'm bored hearing about startups building laundry apps or doing an ICO for something that doesn't really affect the world. Um, there's not enough talent to go around and life is short. Why not spend it on doing something meaningful and something that could move the dial? So um, I hope you succeed. I hope um, you find investors who are aligned with your vision because that's one of the other challenges. Often venture capital is not your friend because the investors have a different mission which is to maximize their returns in the relatively short term. Um, and find mentors who have done similarly difficult things because they will keep you going when everybody says it's impossible. And then if you become Elon Musk, don't go on Twitter. Can I talk? David? Sorry. <laughs> can I ask? Uh, can you compare the uh, media industry with education? Good, sorry, uh, I didn't hear. Can you, can you compare the media industry where you are working now with the education th sphere? Well, this is the public, like the public sphere. What, what's the difference now and what, how will it transform? Because, well, all we talk about the educational sphere is the so you ask public, about public, pur public purpose uh, and not only in efficiency. And the media is, all, is more about efficiency and less about public interest, maybe. What's the public uh, responsibility of the media compared to... Well, everyone is talking about the education is broken and they are not efficient enough. And let's well, do something. Do they talk about media the same, in the same way? I'm well, a strong why? believer in the story. <clears throat> I'm not such a strong believer in the media industry at the moment, because I think <coughs> um, there was too much complacency for too long, and talent left as business models were collapsing. <clears throat> and I haven't seen much grounds for optimism in a lot of the conventional media organizations. And 
I think the worry there is as authority disappears, everybody has equal authority and fake news becomes the result. I don't see easy business models emerging yet. I mean, there are some media companies that are becoming you know, retail platforms and you know, data organizations. But in general, um, I see a big cloud continuing over this industry. If that was what you were asking me. Well, yes. That's, that's, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I don't mean to bring doom and despair. Creative people, though, will find ways to make new kind of business. And you know, if you look at, you know, TV companies have been declining, but Netflix has been booming because it's been offering a service that people want, and it's been investing heavily in the story, and it's been providing technology that actually works. Um, we need a few more Netflixes. People need choice in their media consumption. Sorry, there was a question here. Yes. Дэвид, добрый вечер. У меня вопрос. Фактически все организации, которые вы приводили в пример, они отличаются чуть другой оргструктурой, структурой управления. У них внутренние стартапы. А появляются связи компаний с внешними стартапами. Значит ли это, что нас ждет в ближайшее время инновации не только в цифре, но и в методах управления, в тем, как компании управляются и иерархические компании больше не смогут выживать. So there's no fixed rule that an organization has to be run from the top down. Um, one of the most exciting things about what's being called Web3, the distributed decentralized <coughs> network is um, it rebalances the power structures. So in Web3, rather than a centralized company like Facebook that extracts value centrally, there could be um, a distributed app that has no owner <coughs> that you as a user decide how much of your data you want to share and what reward you get. And we don't need a conventional management for this. The current typical structure of an organization is from the, um, I mean, we call it the Victorian time, the time when you had to get you know, the empire obeying the queen. Um, it doesn't work like that now. If you're the military, there's no point having the commander decide what happens because the enemy is distributed. ISIS and Al-Qaeda are distributed. And your next war will be a cyber war against people who you don't know where they are, but you know the strategies they're using. So how do you create an organization that is a distributed organization that has people able to make informed decisions on the ground? So I think there's a lot of experimentation happening now in organizational structure and leadership. And um, if even big military organizations are rethinking how they lead, um, I think it's going to happen in finance, it's going to happen in healthcare, it's going to happen in manufacturing. We have to be more agile, more responsive, and accept that the customer is going to change their demands very, very quickly in shorter and shorter cycles. And so the organization has to be reinvented in order to adapt to it. So there's hands here. Hi, thank you. So my question is about the drop in attention span that we're seeing. And Sorry, I'm bored with that question. That was a joke. Really? <laughs> um, so the psychological insights got so advanced that we're 
practically all addicted to our iPhones and our computers and such. And the, there was quite a bit of media chatter lately about Apple deciding to downgrade their designs to make it less addictive. Um, so I wanted to know your thoughts about it and maybe to know if you think that the next innovation in media design and um, tech design is downgrading and making it more, you know, more kind on our attention and on our brains and so, so on. I think the big tech companies see a public relations disaster, <clears throat> which is why they're adding features now that they should have added when they first designed their products. They have been very cynical in building addiction into a lot of their products because that is their business model to keep you engaged on the screen and you know they don't care that you're a 12 year old if you've clicked the box to say you're 16 they want your engagement so they can sell against it um, so i'm glad that there is a movement called um, time well spent that is trying to highlight the cynical way that addiction is designed into a lot of the products we use. Um, and I think we need to amplify those concerns. Because the truth is, um, casinos work, fruit machines work, gambling machines work, because they hack our dopamine cycles, they hack our desire to get those intermittent, um, unscheduled rewards. And that's been well known by psychologists for a long time. And those secrets have been built into most of the popular products we use. And it's not really in our interests because we're all human, frail, vulnerable things who don't always act in our own best interests. That's the whole science of behavioral econo economics um, is based on us making decisions that are not really the decisions we should be making. Um, so yeah, let's expose these companies and let's not believe them when they now say, oh, we're really sorry, we didn't realize we were keeping you on our devices for four hours at a time. Of course they did. Thank you. May I ask for, to give an examples of what did you do being a founder and editor of Wired to reframe the value? And my question is practical, since I'm a member of editorial for IT magazine and we have Helen Highwater, as you very well know. So, a few examples, what did you do in Wired to reframe the value, as was pointed uh, in course of the presentation? So when I took over, when I started Wired, <clears throat> we had to build an advertising market from zero. It wasn't necessarily um, an established idea that consumer companies advertise in a tech magazine. Um, and you know, although Condé Nast, which owns Wired, has some very talented people, that sold lots of great brands. And although we had a subscription business, I could see this was never going to be um, reliable in the long term. So I thought, so what's the most valuable thing we have as Wired? It's not a paper magazine. It's not a website. There are lots of those. It's a community of quite hard to reach people who are mostly quite influential, who trusted Wired and who felt it could help them in their work, who felt they learned things from Wired. Because we did long form stories and we went to places that they hadn't come and we invested in design. <clears throat> so then we thought, okay, what will those people pay for and what will organizations do to pay to reach them? So we did two things which were quite successful. First of all, we created an events business where we charged up to 2,000 pounds for a ticket for a two-day event. And 
as well as ticket revenue, we had sponsorship revenue. And when I was there, we ended up doing eight events in a year, some of them themed a finance tech event, a health tech event, an energy event, and then a general two-day event where we just got some amazing storytellers from around the world. And then I also started something um, which we called Wired Consulting, which wasn't a consulting business, but it was a way of bringing our network to the attention of corporates. So for instance, an insurance company in Australia paid us a monthly retainer, and each month they could come up with a subject they wanted to learn more about, and we would either send somebody over to Australia or do a Skype call and explain to them what they wanted to know. So because we knew the startups and the blockchain people and you know the AI people, we could make sure they weren't wasting their time. And also, Wired Consulting would organize internal events for a bank that was doing something for its clients or something. And again, the money they paid for this was high value. And it wasn't because of a magazine, it was because of a network of people that we'd built. Hello. Hello. May I say we are ready for the last question and then uh, we're going to finish our conference, so all of you are welcome tomorrow and day after tomorrow. Um, я, наверное, скажу по-русски. Мы готовы слушать последний вопрос. Приходите, пожалуйста, завтра, приходите послезавтра. У нас будет целый день проходить конференция здесь, на Стрелке. Можете посмотреть в список всех спикеров на сайте, и мы будем рады видеть вас завтра и послезавтра. Спасибо. And I think I'm privileged to have a last question. Uh, so thank you very much for this uh, evening, and thank you for the, my favorite uh, magazine, basically, to turn it out uh, to be the favorite one. Uh, I work a lot with uh, uh, business. Uh, uh, I, I work like in corporation, yeah, uh, so I know like uh, Google and others uh, from inside out. But I work a lot with the uh, medium-sized business. And uh, the challenge which I usually see is that after a presentation like yours, Everybody gets super excited about the future, but then, you know, like logistics doesn't work as expected, call center doesn't work as expected, salespeople doesn't sell as expected, and so on. And that's all get ruined, yeah, under the present uh, challenges. So my question to you, uh, because I'm also asked usually this question, I am interested in your opinion. What is the right, what is your suggestion to medium-sized business to balance out the present and the future? How they should be organized to, to balance this out and not to be ruined? Thank you. And if I get this right, do I earn like four trillion rubles? Because this is so much value riding on it. <clears throat> it comes down to leadership. It comes down to management exciting the people and setting examples and setting targets for them to <clears throat> change how they contribute to the company. And not all management is capable of doing this. And, you know, Charles Darwin observed that it's not always the strongest or the most intelligent that survive. It's those most adapted to their changing circumstances. And I think the same is true of you know, medium-sized businesses. You need to create an internal culture where the sales, the marketing, the product people um, anticipate changing customer behavior and demand. Um, because if they're too slow, the competition is fierce. And if they are focusing on their own internal concerns, such as the sales target, or the fact that the boss doesn't like doing this sort of thing, um, they are at, an at a disadvantage. I mean, I, th th there were some small companies I found, and medium-sized companies, you know, the bookshop is one, but it's because it is led by somebody who married into the family that had had the bookshop for 80 years, and he was motivated to try and change it to save the family's business. If you're just an employee, you're probably not gonna be that motivated. 
Nobody likes doing something that is really, really difficult. Good luck, though, if you find it. Let me know. Thank you, everybody, for coming and for listening.